that happened at AED, I would be talking and then this, this video would delay right behind my head. Um, welcome again, everyone. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am trained as an international political economist. Uh, my expertise is in what kinds of particularly national level policies help to promote uh, entrepreneurial and innovative activities at the local level. I know nothing about the science other than what my daughter teaches me. She's a bioengineering major. So I look forward to learning from all of you today. Uh, and I particularly am eager to hear your thoughts about when I bring up the case studies from China, India, and Japan, how this might resonate with your own work. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, again, I advise policymakers at the national and international level. And so your feedback today would be really helpful for me in writing better policy. So I was told I had an hour. I'll try to cut it down a little bit shorter. Let's get my little clicker here, make sure that I know what I'm doing. Okay, so as you can see, uh, it's a long title because I wanted to appeal to many people to join today. And I'm really impressed that you all uh, came uh, because in uh, Chicago, we don't have school on Saturday. So getting PhD <laughs> students to <laughs> come on a Saturday is, must be thanks to Dr. Tibu's uh, inspirational leadership, I'm sure. Um, but today I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the key findings in my most recent book called Pandemic Medicine, which I'll introduce shortly. I would also like to talk about the analytical framework that drives the way in which I have tried to understand how particularly national governments have responded to what is called crisis innovation in the COVID-19 pandemic, but also more broadly in what I would call an age of pandemics. And in fact, I forgot my notes here. Sorry, I've stepped off a of frame. I know that's bad. Here I am, I'm back in frame. So by way of int introduction, ooh, transition. Uh, this talk today is based upon two books. And uh, this book was published in 2019. It's called Beyond Technonationalism, Biomedical Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Asia. In this book, I analyze China, India, Japan, and Singapore in terms of how national governments have tried to encourage science and technology-based entrepreneurship in the biomedical field. So the subject of this book incorporates biopharmaceuticals, synthetic pharmaceutical drugs, but also medical devices, diagnostics, treatments, uh, instruments. So how these national economies have looked at the future and decided that the economies not only need to be resilient in times of epidemic or potential pandemic threat, but also be competitive uh, in terms of the growing sector of health and healthcare. So how can economies in Asia compete head to head with the advancements in the Western world? So this was about um, analyzing how different Asian economies either utilize or underutilize transnational scientific networks. This book is more specifically about how we have entered an age of pandemics, how within the last 10 years alone, uh, three to five epidemics of potentially global proportion have threatened humanity. It just so happens that the latest, the coronavirus, was the most uh, devastating across the globe. But as you know, here in India, a number of prior epidemic outbreaks from the same country, China, um, have threatened uh, communities all the way through uh, the contiguous states with China, but also via the port cities here in India, as I'm sure you're aware with SARS and the previous MERS, which are all uh, respiratory uh, conditions. So by way of background, I was in uh, Delhi in 2016. Can you hear me okay? Is it okay? May I continue? Okay. In 2016, I was here in, uh, well, not here, here's the thing, but in India, in Delhi, interviewing uh, venture capitalists who had been early investors in a Biocon, which is now India's largest biotechnology company, led by, I'm proud to say, a woman entrepreneur, 
who actually is one of the richest women in the world now. Uh, if you don't know her name already, her name is Karan Mazumdar Shah, yes. And so I was uh, in Delhi interviewing some folks on background who had been involved in her startup you know, years and years ago when she was still uh, an ent fledgling entrepreneur, literally working out of a garage in Bengaluru. And one of my sources told me that, well, obviously you know that the WTO TRIPS Accord, which is the trade-related aspect of intellectual property rights, that accord was designed by Pfizer in the mid-1980s before the WTO was even founded. And I said, well, I knew that there was, uh, you know, obviously some corporate influence, but the next thing he said was even more disturbing for me. And he said, well, they were targeting us. They were targeting India. And I said, why would they do that? And he said, well, we were offering antiretrovirals and vaccines to the developing world, particularly the global south, at cost or marginally above cost, as Dr. Chilu talked about the last time we were here. And as a result, children all over Africa in particular were dying because they were being denied access to these healing, but also life-saving drugs. And I was confused, you know, idealist, academic, why would, why would, how could this possibly be the reality? Uh, and it was obvious after a little bit of digging that the reason why Pfizer targeted India is because if India is providing the world with healing remedies and solutions and drugs and treatments at cost, what is that going to do to the profit portfolio of Pfizer? That's going to be bad news for them. And so Pfizer, with a number of other chemical companies, actually designed the WTO TRIPS, which is, how does that work? Well, instead of going through the WHO, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, or uh, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, what you would think would be, those would be the purview, intellectual property rights would be WIPO, health, human health would be maybe parts of the United Nations, UNESCO, but particularly the World Health Organization. Instead of going through those established organizations, what the pharma lobby did was create its own organization. Before the World Trade Organization was even written in treaties, Pfizer was able to create the intellectual property rights regime that buttresses the World Trade Organization and punishes countries that offer off-patent medicines to the developing world. And how do those countries get punished? they are denied access to the hundreds of advanced economies that comprise the world's largest consumer markets. And so they're using this very much a carrot and a stick approach as a way to make developing countries, quote unquote, compliant with the TRIPS Accord. And we had a wonderful interview the other day with Dr. Ari Mashabkar, uh, who was at the forefront of challenging patents on Indian traditional medicine. And I'll talk about uh, one of the case studies that he was uh, involved with shortly. But there must be a better solution. The COVID-19 crisis told us that we cannot continue to function as crisis innovators. We need to establish the agreements, the peer-to-peer -peer relationships with scientists in an open source manner, which in fact, India is at the forefront of leading so that we can be prepared, not as individual countries, not as individual companies, but as humans, as part of humanity, to save ourselves from the next calamity. So that is what led me in part, I shared a different story, which I'm not gonna to repeat today, to why I wanted to write this book. Because it was obvious that the system is broken. You know, I hunkered down. I was very fortunate. Oh, I hit that. Sorry. Um, I was very fortunate that I had a, a, a professional job where I was allowed to continue my job at the same salary from the comfort of an upstairs, upstairs bedroom as long as I had functioning Wi-Fi. But I know that even in the United States, which is perceived to be an advanced developed economy, many, many people were told they were essential workers. So they were essential workers and they were forced to go back. Who were the essential workers? Nurses, doctors, delivery personnel, Amazon warehouse workers. They were forced to go back to work. And of course, obviously the, the healthcare professionals went back to work willingly because they wanted to save patients. Uh, but other workers were compelled to go back to work 
or risk losing their job. And this was in the first months of the pandemic in 2020, when there was no vaccine anywhere near on the horizon. And so many of these people, unfortunately, even though they're young and healthy, they become, became ill with COVID, but they were asymptomatic. Many of these families live in multi-generational homes. And so they didn't die, but their aunties, their uncles, their grandmas died because these essential workers were forced to go on the front line and they brought that virus back home with them. So that really led me to uh, ask the big questions, you know? This cannot continue the way it is, right? Because we need, to, we need to fix this problem so that we can take care of ourselves, our families, our country, but also every other human on this earth that does not have the advantages of sitting around here in a nice air conditioned space, talking about the big abstract problems, doing the important scientific work, but we're not on the side of the road trying to make a daily living, uh, as are the essential workers in the United States. So it's really, what we need to do is create a system that is health for all people and not just for the people who can pay for it. So I just wanna go over, and again, I was told I had an hour, so I'm just gonna share a lot of the main points of the book. I'm so excited. This is uh, the longest time that I've had the opportunity to share uh, the main uh, findings of the book. And of course, it is a policy framework driven, but organizational case study. So using the narrative stories of individual science and technology entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, nonprofit organizational leaders, and in some cases, um, national heroes who really took on uh, the challenge of trying to bring healing uh, vaccines and remedies to the rest of the world. So I'll be going through the synopsis of the book. Uh, what the objectives of what I'm going to share with you today. Um, and then I'm going to actually, uh, I didn't have time to check with you about this because we were in the garden, but I'd like to sort of take a break in the middle to give us a little bit of a discussion opportunity. So I'm going to be giving you a discussion, a uh, small group discussion uh, prompt, and we're just going to spend about five minutes brainstorming, and then we're going to come back together and share ideas, and then I'll continue on with the last part of the talk. So I normally tell my students, never have this much, much text in the slide, but I wanted to make sure that um, I went over what it is that the book does. It really analyzes the rise and decline of the innovative capacity of the global pharmaceutical industry. Because even though the global pharmaceutical industry continues to profit, they're profiting based upon innovations that occurred almost 100 years ago. And as you know, what they're doing is they are creating so-called new molecular entities that are actually are not very new. They are tweaking at a molecular level, a molecular entity that was either copied from traditional medicine, it's true, 60 to 70% uh, of all of the pharmaceutical drugs on the market today come from pharmaceutical companies sending ethnobotanists out there into the field to interview people about what they use in their practices. And that's how the vast majority of drugs on the market have come, um, either by uh, modeling the formulations of traditional doctors or modeling the uh, efficacy of natural herbs themselves in situ in the environment in indigenous communities around the world through a process that is called, from the uh, pharmaceutical company's perspective, bioprospecting, but from the target community's perspective, it's biopiracy. Because what the pharmaceutical company has done is gone in there, sent people into the field. Sometimes they harvest up the whole plant and then what's left for the next people who need it in the community, it's, it's gone. And so that's why it's called biopiracy. Um, and in fact, when I get to the India case, it was only until the mid 1990s that this practice uh, was challenged. And then uh, pharmaceutical companies made a pivot away from trying to use, to use uh, traditional medicine formulations and really started to ramp up their research and development into synthetic pharmaceutical drugs. So we've all heard of the opioid crisis in the United States, taking a natural sub substance that in small quantities is used as a healing um, uh, drug, opium, I'm speaking of opium and po uh, derivatives of poppy, uh, and turning it into something synthetic that is not only much more potent, 
but actually doesn't help the patient at all, makes them more ill in the long term, but at the same time ensures a long pipeline of repeat customer because as pharmaceutical executives say behind closed doors, an addicted customer is a repeat customer. And in fact, as I write in this book, uh, pharmaceutical executives, including from Merck, actually said as part of their marketing portfolio uh, as early back as the 80s, that they wanted to sell drugs like chewing gum. They wanted it to be like candy for patients because if, it's, if people want that sort of rush and that kind of high and that kind of pain relief, they're gonna seek that out on a daily basis and therefore can increase the profits of those companies. So the main objectives today, which you can't see there in the corner, um, uh, is describing the uh, market failures as I talked about, but also um, the way in which innovative output has declined while we have a rise in potentially threatening uh, pandemic disease conditions. And these disease conditions are not just viral, they're bacterial. Um, a lot of these viral epidemic diseases are emerging through a process that you are very familiar with called zoonosis, where particularly in China, why have a lot of these emerged in the ecosystem or the ecology of China? It's because you have on the one hand, very, very dense urban populated areas that are encroaching on the wild ecosystems, which are called res reservoirs, you all know this. Um, so these communities are coming closer and closer contact. And, and so birds in particular, but also bats and rodents um, in these night markets, but also day markets are interacting 24 seven. And those diseases are mutating so that they are not just in the animal kingdom, meaning the non-human animal kingdom, but now are spreading into human populations. Uh, the second thing that I'm going to do is identify the key initiatives related to this uh, in terms of protecting and conserving traditional medicinal knowledge, but also the plant medicinal biodiversity that undergirds and supports that medicinal knowledge. Now, I acknowledge that a number of traditional medicines are also derived from the animal world, uh, as well as uh, microorganisms, but the focus of this book is particularly those plant medicinals, hence my delay because I was spending so much time looking at plants in the medicinal garden. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical framework, and that's where I would really appreciate your critical feedback because the framework has come as the result of observing cases, including in India, and I'm really curious as to what your thoughts are. Does it resonate with you? Does it make sense? Would you make a different, uh, would you describe it in a different way? And then finally, I'll share with you some case studies, particularly from uh, China, India, and Japan. So this framework starts with asking, what is an innovation commons? And I'm going to say right, right uh, up front that my work has been inspired by the Nobel Prize winning uh, political science trained economist, uh, Dr. Eleanor Ostrom, who has uh, since passed. And she uh, had a research lab at University of Indiana, which is the state next door to mine in Illinois. And she wrote a lot about the way in which communities sustainably govern their resources. And she came up with a concept of governing the commons. And so I've been inspired to talk about that at my own contribution in terms of, because I'm an expert in innovation and entrepreneurship and innovation commons. So let's just start. What is a commons? A commons is some space where something can be shared by all. But in order for it to maintain or to be uh, available for future generations, you have to share those things sustainably. You can't just take all the water for your own farm. You can't just take all the water for your textile mill and then put effluent back into the water stream and it's going to poison all the crops downstream, not to mention the animals who graze in it. Right? So uh, thinking about that in terms of what is the innovation commons then for drugs and medicine, let me give you one example. And I love this example because my daughter, who's a bioengineering major. Hi, Elizabeth, in case you're watching this on YouTube. At University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Jonas Salk. Does anyone recognize that name? Jonas Salk? 
Very good. And in 1952, he invented the polio vaccine, which has been eradicated in countries like India and the United States and Western Europe and Japan, uh, unfortunately, is sort of popping up in other areas of the world. But he shared the discovery of the polio vaccine with the world. He refused to patent. And when asked in that year why he chose not to patent, he answered, can you patent the sun? No, of course not. This is part of the natural world. We can't just take parts of the natural world that belong to everyone in an innovation commons. We need to share those things with humanity so our children are, because polio, as you know, affected the children the worst. If it didn't kill them, it would paralyze them. They wouldn't be able to breathe and they had to live in these iron lungs. Of course, this is well before I was born, uh, but I remember stories from my older relatives about people who had to live out the rest of their lives in iron lungs and it was not a, it was not a happy existence. So, when we apply these questions to drug discovery, we understand that although the profits, oh, I have a pointer at the top. Where's the button for the pointer? Oh, okay. All the profits, I'm not wearing my reading glasses, by the way, because I'm on YouTube, so I don't want to be wearing my old lady glasses. So downside is that I can't see what I'm doing. Okay, so as, as those challenges to patenting the living world were more successful, particularly in the mid 1990s, and again, I'll get to why that is later. Pharmaceutical companies, not only because of that, it's a lot easier to isolate individual molecular based drugs. It's easy to trace the efficacy of a particular compound if it's just one isolate, right? You all know your scientists on a particular disease condition, and this is very sort of prevalent in the Western world. You take a tiny, tiny little part of an overall healing medicine and you put it in a mice, in some mice and then in humans, and if it seems to work and not kill them, that's a profitable drug you have right there. But we all know, um, or you all know, uh, but most Americans do not know uh, that actually the most healing remedies come from these ancient traditions of healing, Ayurved, traditional Chinese medicine, traditional Japanese medicine, all of the, the traditions that are prevalent all over, particularly in the global South, but also the ancient teachings about them. And it makes me so proud to be able to have this conversation with you. You know, the most ancient and highest level was out of the Indus civilization. Now, of course, I mean, I know that there are um, migratory flows, the invasion of the Mughals, the influence of Middle East trade brought in different remedies and herbs along those trade routes, but the but the essence was already written in the Vedas, right? Um, so we know that there's tremendous potential for these healing biologicals. But right now, all of the investment is going into these synthetic chemicals, hence the opioid crisis in the United States. So what is to be done about that? How do we aim for drug discovery through a global intellectual property rights regime framework that works for innovators, entrepreneurs, university scientists like yourselves, ordinary people, patients, and citizen scientists. I love the idea that there's citizen scientist movements all over the world. Uh, several of them emerged in uh, India, in fact. So if we think about the complexity of how we can work together to bring forth healing remedies that more people can access, but at an affordable and, and equitable price, we have overlapping issue areas that are the purview of different organizations. So we know that the sustainable uh, development goals that were negotiated over a number of years at the UN um, in part draw from ideas coming out of the Convention on Biodiversity. How do we maintain these mega biodiverse spaces? How do we incentivize? countries that are biodiverse, like India, like China, like Brazil, um, along that, that, and biodiversity, as you know, is because you have a lot of land from north to south, and you have different uh, microclimates that can support all of these particularly wild varieties of medicinals. Why it's important to protect that biodiversity for its own sake, but also as a potential reservoir for future healing remedies. And then we have the organizations that are 
charged with supporting human health. The World Health Organization uh, did a lot, tried to do a lot uh, in the midst of the pandemic crisis that we've just experienced. Um, it had a lot of help from countries. Uh, it had some uh, reluctant help from the major pharmaceutical firms, but they were able to bring, you know, not billions of doses, but millions of doses to the developing world. But it took a long time, and it and uh, there were some pharmaceutical firms that were not as cooperative in the vision uh, of the WHO. And then we have the intellectual property rights regime. So if we were to think about this diagram, and this is something I do with my students, is you know, these are the issue areas. There's medicinal plant genetic material that is both the purview of the World Health Organization because it can bring in uh, healing remedies, but also the purview of the United Nations uh, Convention on, on Biodiversity. And we're really looking for a global policy framework that is balanced because after all, if we are out of balance in our bodies, we become ill. So taking that analogy forward to the world, if we're a world out of balance with the natural world, we're gonna sicken ourselves, but also kill the very earth that sustains our life and everyone else's life around this. This is something that in uh, some countries, I might be from one of them, <laughs> people don't think about it on a daily basis. We're very urbanized. We don't have a day-to-day -day relationship with, with nature. You have to go, uh, take a lot of effort to go and be in nature. Um, unlike places like Japan or in Scandinavia, I was on a panel um, at the Asia Economic Dialogue hosted by the Pune International Center, uh, whose president is Dr. Ari Malshakar, uh, hosted by Dr., uh, uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawali. And we were on a panel together with a gentleman from Finland. I'm half Finn and half Japanese. And he was saying that over 70% of the land mass in that country is either lake or forest or both. 180,000 lakes and 70% of the land mass is forested. Meaning you can, in an afternoon, on your lunch break or tea break, take a walk in a forest, even if you live in a place that's healthy. And so people in Scandinavia, Finland in particular, have a closer relationship with nature because nature is always around them. And they have a, in countries like um, Bhutan, uh, we also were on, I watched a panel and it was a group of finance, finance ministers, one of them was from Bhutan, and he said that is written into the Bhutanese constitution that not less than 60%, the actual number is 70, but not less than 60% of their entire land mass must at all times be covered with forest. So again, reason why in all of these global surveys that the Bhutanese are routinely shown as being the happiest is because they have that relationship with nature that's in balance. In the United States, there's been a new trend called forest bathing, but that is something that Japanese people do, again, on a daily basis because they can stroll even in an urban center and go to a park and be among the forest. Um, one of the most interesting things that I learned recently is that there's actually a fungi um, that is endemic to most forests that is like a happy fungi. So you breathe in the spores, it's not gonna make you sick, it might make you sneeze maybe, but it's like a soothing, like very, like very uh, calming effect on the overall body. And of course, uh, biopharmaceutical companies are trying to harvest this fungi now to make aphrodisiacs and you know happy drugs. Good for them. I hope they. I hope they uh, have fun with that. But what is going on right now in terms of the rise and the decline of innovation in particularly the global pharmaceutical space? So in a country like the United States, we have what is called an inverse pyramid relationship between the kinds of medicines that are available for the upper class, middle class, and lower class by income. So very, very, very few um, people in these lower income groups can access this tiny little bit of medicines at an affordable price. Whereas wealthy people in the upper class have plenty of access to what is called boutique drugs. So lifestyle drugs are, I mean, some would argue that, um, you know, having an espresso in the morning is a lifestyle drug. We don't really need it. What we really should be doing is drinking some weak tea or maybe having a nice 
fresh glass of mineral water. We really shouldn't be uh, putting chemicals into our body first thing in the morning to get us going when we should be doing. And admittedly, I was given some uh, proper breathing uh, techniques by an Ayurveda doctor in 2017. And I'm sorry to say, I don't do those on a daily basis. I know I should, I skipped them today because I had to prepare for this talk. Um, so part of the reason why I'm feeling a little sleepy is because I skipped that self-maintenance and self-care. And I tried my best not to have too much masala tea with them. But what are these boutique drugs? Now we know that the life, what are the life saving? That's the, those are the immunizations, the polio vaccine that I talked about, the flu vaccine that uh, quite often people take, uh, particularly if you're in a climate like Chicago where there's more flu prevalent than in a climate like this because between the months of November and April, we're all inside trying to stay warm. And so we're in closer proximity with other people who are exhaling, exhaling potential pathogens. Well, what are these boutique drugs? Anybody have an example of a boutique drug? Well, yeah, so something that's elective, you don't really need it to survive, but it's going to make you feel better about the way your body looks. Uh, other boutique drugs are uh, selective sex identification for pregnancies. You don't really need that, but if you're in a society where there's this a uh, misbegotten belief that men uh, are better to have as babies. I have one boy and one girl um, who are um, uh, delightful, but if I'd had two boys or two girls, I think I would have been just as happy. Um, other boutique drugs, unfortunately, that are developed by major uh, pharmaceutical firms in the United States can cost up to a million, if not more, per dose. And unfortunately, these boutique drugs are targeting ailments that affect children. And so what family would not want to pay a million dollars to save their child from certain death or uh, some uh, less than optimal uh, mobility or cognitive ability? Of course, you're gonna to wanna to spend any, anything that you can. And therefore these boutique drugs are developed specifically to be able to guarantee that families are gonna be willing to pay that amount if their insurance is built. So thinking about this framework, I would like now to break into, if, you're, if, it's, if that's okay, groups of, um, uh, is four, three or four good? Dr. Kuhn, three, uh, groups of three or four people? Groups of three or four people? Uh, let's say three, we'll do three. So discussion questions. So I'm just gonna go like I'm teaching. One, two, three, you're a group. One, two, three, your group. One, two, three, your group. One, two, three. So you're gonna have to stop videotaping to be in the group. Uh, one, two, three, your group. One, two, three, your group. One, two, three, your group. And then you two can pop into any group you want. Okay? All right, so the, the question is, I guess we can, pause, we can pause the recording here, but after I give the prompt. Should pharmaceutical companies be driven by profit or noblesse oblige. This is a fan. I'm, I'm learning French. So, um, noblesse oblige, what's the meaning of that? Anybody who studied French? Right. So, if you are in a position of having the wealth, and that's not limited to wealth of money, wealth of knowledge, wealth of ability, wealth of capability, wealth of the power that you have in the world, you are obligated by virtue of the fact that you have that power and influence to share that with the world for good, for doing good, for doing good. And this is something, although it's a French concept that very much drives uh, a lot of the actual corporate social responsibility as I'll talk, talk about later uh, in the case of Japan, where this, there's this natural sense of, of course, I'm gonna give back uh, once I reach a certain level in my career. It's just something that you do, again, to maintain a balance between yourself and the world around you and the people around you. All right, so can we pause the uh, recording here? All right, so five minutes to have a quick brainstorming. So we're about halfway through. I'm going to just mention some of the case studies very, very briefly, just to get you uh, thinking visually about what is going on on the ground in countries like India, China, and Japan. So uh, if we think about how do political economists like me collect observations and be able to analyze them, so I'm trained as a political scientist. And so we have a habit of putting things in what is called a two by two matrix. And this is, a, you could see these, 
kidding, I have this pointer. <laughs> you can see these gray uh, lines here that those represent the four quadrants, right? But it's always going to reflect some quantitative or observational basis that you can count up or rank ordinally. So the y-axis is measuring novelty. So if we're talking about new drug discovery, is it new? Has it not been discovered before? Is there not prior art? Unlike the case in the turmeric patents that were overturned, the Basmati patents that were overturned where uh, Indian uh, national heroes were able to, although at great cost, uh, to the ultimately to the Indian taxpayer, we're able to demonstrate that no, actually these formulations have been written in the Vedas um, many thousands of years ago, so they constitute prior art. So those patents were eventually overturned. So they were actually not very novel, right? But also, you want to think about what is the innovation architecture to create new ideas that are helpful for human health. So you want to have architectures that are open to the exchange of information. And so if you think about it in terms of the observation, right? So if things are open and also novel, you not only are generating new and interesting ideas that contribute to developing helpful drugs and therapies for the world, you are sharing those discoveries and having this return on the investment of sharing because other people are contributing, they learn about these great innovations, they're inspired by your noblesse oblige, like Jonas Salk. Uh, and so you have a mutually positive uh, reinforcing scenario. Right now, what we have in the American patent system uh, at the behest of major companies like Pfizer, Merck, and not, not just the American uh, pharmaceutical firms, but also the agro-business companies like Monsanto, the chemical companies like Dow, um, et cetera. You have innovation silos. So, Things that were quote unquote discovered many decades ago are being protected because those improvements on those drugs are not being shared beyond the confines of the uh, boundaries of the firm. And they're just sort of re reflexively repatenting the same things. So their new therapies are not being shared, right? Because there's more money in just repeating the, uh, tweaking the existing drug and extending the patent for another 20 years. And that's what's unfortunately has been the pattern, which is why we see a rise, but a decline in innovative output uh, on the part of major pharmaceutical firms, because they're focused on the profit and not on the novelty and the sharing, right? So let's talk about, so this is all very abstract, right? So, you know, thinking about things on an, on an X axis versus a Y axis, and how do we, you know, it's almost, five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, it's getting hot and stuffy, we haven't had our snack, the snacks came in, but we're not allowed to eat them. <laughs> uh, and, you know, how does this make any sense when you're thinking about reality? What are people actually doing? So let's talk about some of the case studies. And again, I wrote in this book, particularly about China, India, and Japan. So just briefly, if we think about what's going on in China, they are taking a uh, an approach um, so if you could just have in your mind that X, Y axis that I had is that what they've done is very similar in, at least in the structure of it, to the traditional knowledge data library that the Indian government uh, created. But the National Registry for Traditional Chinese Medicine did something almost the same. They went out, sent thousands of um, uh, ethnobotanists in particular who were from the regions of uh, long, that had long histories, both in traditional medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, but also um, having a direct relationship with uh, the collection sustainably of the wild varieties of the plants that go into these medicines. And they collected it all and they put it in a national registry as a way to demonstrate to anyone trying to patent any so-called discovery based upon Chinese traditional medicine that there existed prior art and therefore was not patentable. Unfortunately, because all of this data that goes back all the way to the earliest writings and some of this, these formulations were never written down because they were what is called folk medicine uh, from tribal communities in the mountains. And these communities in particular um, uh, in China, but also obviously in India and Japan, uh, these mountain communities may not have had a written language, but they had a very uh, highly developed sophisticated oral traditions um, to teach people how to extract 
sustainably, how to, how to harvest sustainably, um, to pick only what you needed uh, so you don't kill the whole plant or the tree, um, but also how to extract the essence of what was needed for the therapy um, in the appropriate way. What was the right temperature? In fact, it was tied a lot to um, what time of day did you harvest it because the potency of a particular compound, uh, what you really need is something that's high, three o'clock in the morning or something like that. So having that intimate, again, balance with nature and knowledge. So there's a lot of novelty in this um, database, but it's, it's hidden behind a cage. So the Chinese government, actually uh, Xi Jinping in particular has, has as part of a national strategy to promote uh, Chinese innovations, has made this um, registry, unfortunately, not accessible by the very, uh, by the research team that collected the data. So once they collected their data, set up the database, they were locked out of their, their own database. So it's very much a cage. There's lots of potential uh, new drug discovery in there, but nobody can use it right now because of this idea of, oh, can we go to the next? I want, my clicker's not working. So this is a Center for Biodiversity and Indigenous Knowledge. This will look familiar to those of you who do work in the field. Um, what they're trying to do is, again, in community with these mountain uh, village indigenous groups, um, learn how to sustainably reestablish certain varieties. But of course, you know, you're all scientists, that it's not something you just plant in the ground and come back a year later. It could take 25 or 30 years for that to sort of revert back to its original potency. So I'm going to skip this. This is mostly just giving you an idea of the that China has in protecting its traditional traditional medicine. So not only collecting the data, but being able to have a variety of government ministries involved in making sure that that data remains within the boundaries of China. In fact, I was in Japan doing some research with one of the other cases here, and they have forbade even taking photos of medicinal plants. Um, so you can't even have a photo, you can't publish a photo. Like obviously you could take a photo and keep it on your phone. Nobody's gonna, I mean, although nowadays you never know how, how much you're being tracked in China. Um, but you can't publish that. You can't share that knowledge with anybody. So again, all this very, very potentially helpful knowledge is being hidden behind these cages. So if we were to think about the key terms that we associate with China, it's very much a techno-nationalist approach. It's saying, we are only going to have these discoveries for Chinese. Uh, we're not going to share them with anyone, uh, Chinese first. And therefore, these discoveries are going to stay um, in cages and not share with others. So India, on the other hand, uh, thanks to the pioneering work of uh, our Dr. R. A. Mashalkar, who is now president of uh, Pune um, International Center, uh, was, as we learned, as we learned, oh, let's have Medju sh share that story. Medju, will you come up here and join me and share the story about how Dr. Mashalkar learned about the turmeric parent in, uh, patent in the United States? Come here in the in the frame. Medju is going to tell the story. Um, so Dr. We are trying. I speak louder. Okay. So on a fine morning, Dr. Mashalkar was reading the Times of India, and he saw this headline that was saying that the United States had patented healing properties of ground-up turmeric powder, and he was shocked. His reaction was that of uh, aghast because. His grandmother used to use powdered turmeric to heal any wound or little nick or scratch that he used to have. So he thought that this is traditional knowledge, which my grandmother knew, my friend's grandmother knew, and basically almost every other Indian knows. So why has the U.S. patented it? And he was working as secretary of the Indian government at that time. Uh, he wasn't supposed to you know, publicly announce his... Um, 
non support for this patent but he still did it because he said that this is something that should be in the public commons and cannot be patented just for one particular pharma company to make profits out of so that evening he announced that he is going against this patent and that day onwards he started working on his journey against the us patenting of turmeric and then he moved on to basmati as well thank you I wouldn't be able to survive these uh, field research visits without young, talented research assistants like Nadul, who has a very bright future ahead. And I hope her mother gets to see this YouTube video when she gets home. So the other thing that's really interesting about the Indian case is again, operating in that space of the sandbox. And that's why it's such an honor to be amongst the actual scientists who do this thing in reality, because you know I'm just a political economist. I come to the field for a few weeks or months at a time, and I interview folks like you, but I don't get to stand beside you as you're making the discoveries. I don't get to, I mean, once in a while I go to a, a, a herbal medicinal garden, but I don't get to work in the soil. I don't get to experience the plants on a daily basis and really be in that kind of, that scientific, um, that sacred natural space with you. And so it's such an honor to be with you uh, again today. But what's really interesting is around the same time, uh, utilizing the then highly developed intellectual capacity, particularly in IT and programming, uh, to think about ways in which drug discovery could be held open to anyone who wanted to uh, partake in it. So scientists like yourselves, but also undergraduate students, um, people who have an interest in botany, but it's only as a, as a hobby, um, discover some interesting interaction, and they're able to upload that, that sort of discovery that may be new to them, but somebody else has already discovered it or it's already written in, in the data. But being able to load all of that knowledge up together and hold it for the open commons, because some of the best innovative activity as Dr. Kilu knows, happens in an interdisciplinary way. It doesn't happen in your own disciplinary silo, right? So the most important innovations that uh, are brought to humanity are not only within our discipline, uh, but shared because we've been exchanging this interesting knowledge, different perspectives, as uh, Dr. Kilu told us last week in, in his conversation. And so uh, this is another example where India is at the forefront of these kinds of innovations that are held in the public commons. So as you can see, India has accomplished this. I feel silly even saying this, but <laughs> despite not having the same level of uh, resource and capacity as your neighbor uh, to the north, um, who has probably twice as much capacity and lots of uh, tax funds with which to invest in consolidating their position but also their dominance in uh, health and medicine technologies. And then finally, thinking about how, and in fact, this defensive approach uh, was a way, uh, and in fact, folks like Dr. Mashalkar talk about it in terms of, well, we can't fight every single patent. You can't fight every single patent because it's too, it takes too much time. You're, you're taking time away from being innovative to battle things in court. And also it's very costly. You have to hire proper uh, barristers, lawyers, patent agents. And so it's more of a defensive posture to decide which specific formulations are the most offensive and how can we use fighting those successfully to create a sense around the world that these discoveries are held in the public commons. They're gonna remain there forever. Don't try this with other uh, natural medicines. And so that's been the approach of the national government of India. And uh, as I said before, um, sandboxes. And then finally, Japan has taken a more meso approach. And so they're down over, if you can remember the X, Y axis, they're kind of over here in the pools. I call them pools, meaning um, they're open. They're sharing discoveries that these major Japanese pharmaceutical companies have made decades ago but maybe these are underutilized compounds. And so they, what they've done is they've brought together through a public-private partnership uh, using uh, Japanese taxpayer money, but also having the reach of the health and welfare ministry, the ministry of, the, of uh, the foreign ministry, in fact, to engage in health diplomacy in bringing uh, therapies to the developing world to lessen the 
incidence of schistosomiasis, which is a parasitic condition, as you know, that is uh, endemic to the global south, um, uh, where when there's not an, uh, a source of clean water uh, readily on a daily basis, uh, children are more likely to catch this parasite. But also promising therapies that are in stage two or three clinical trials for tuberculosis and other chronic conditions. And the other thing that um, I'd like to bring up in terms of the last case, case study is Takeda Pharmaceutical has also contributed to the GHIT along with Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, et cetera, uh, and some private funders. But they also maintain this 500 hectare plant medicinal garden nestled in the Northern mountains of Kyoto. And it's called the Kyoto Takeda Garden, but it's actually, it's the formal name for it is the Takeda Garden for Medicinal Plant Conservation. And what they do is they have, they maintain a globally connected seed and rhizome bank, but they also try to grow. And again, um, Kyoto is not a tropical zone. So, you know, most of the things that are, could be grown here in Maharashtra are not available, or cannot be grown in, in uh, Kyoto. But for those that are in the same latitude, they have gone all around the world and they uh, are serving, and again, with partnership with botanical gardens all over the world in the same zone, um, exchanging the trees, exchanging the plants and having them in situ and, and keeping them alive in situ in case of some catastrophic event in other places. And so what they've done is maintain this trans 